what does this partnership with NASA represent in real terms yeah. for Uber Air as a product and Elevate as the initiative? Yes, good. Um, so uh, t taking a step back, you know, NASA is the inventor of uh, new airspace management technology. It's a framework, essentially, or standard um, called UTM, which is Unmanned Aerial Systems Traffic Management. Um, and the reason this is important is because with uh, Uber Air, we're going to be having a lot of aircraft flying over cities, an unprecedented number of aircraft flying over cities. Um, and in order to manage that air traffic in a way that's um, efficient and safe, um, we just need new technology. The UTM, we believe, is the answer to that. Um, and, that and there's a lot of people who believe that. That's a, it's, it's pretty widely accepted at this point. The Space Act represents a formal collaboration agreement between Uber and NASA. Um, and many, many people forget that NASA is the National Aeronautics and Space administration. They actually, you know, uh, focus a ton of their energy on aviation. Um, and, uh, and so the, since they're the developer of this technology and they, play, they are very connected in, uh, and, you know, engaged with regulatory bodies around it as well, this collaboration makes a ton of sense in order to, um, you know, bring this to market as fast as possible. And it's a part of making this Uber Air vision a reality. That's exciting. Yes. And NASA is, is a big partner. Yeah. But the cynic would say, this is pie in the sky thinking. Mm. What is... NASA's involvement mean for the reality of Uber Air actually happening? Oh, well, so the way we're approaching it is um, we, we are not boiling the ocean and trying to change all the airspace technology at the same time. Um, you know, uh, NASA's developing the framework, and they have a whole kind of model for testing it under different conditions, these the technical capability level approaches. And we're engaging with them in the last stage of that called technical capability level four. Um, this is about working in, in sort of uh, you know, dense urban environments. And so we're already very advanced and far along with our process. But we are actually, Uber is developing the technology to implement this. So we will actually be building the actual technology that the aircraft will talk to in actually managing and navigating airspace. And we're also trying not to boil the ocean, as I mentioned, uh, and change this all at once, but instead work next to existing air traffic control systems and implement UTM on just areas like corridors through classically controlled air traffic, uh, airspace. And so this approach is kind of like, you know, uh, sort of you know, crawl before you walk, walk before you run, in co combination with us building the technology and NASA bringing their expertise on airspace and simulation environments and that type of thing is a perfect gathering of, of kind of the forces and, and skills to make this happen as fast as possible. One big question for VTOL is batteries, right? And when you're developing the craft itself, mm -hmm. there's an issue over size and weight. Yes. Have you thought about that? What is the next step for Uber in looking at battery research? Is that another thing that you could be moving into to speed up the wider project? Yeah, well, battery research is something we're looking at very closely right now. We may have some announcements on this in the future. Um, and, uh, but you can assume that we're going to be digging into that deeply. Um, the battery technology of today will actually let us do, if we were to take literally the lithium-ion batteries of today and package them up the right way for an elevated vehicle, for an Uber Air vehicle, um, we could actually fly a subset of our missions. So on the order of kind of 25 miles, not 60 miles. We have a 60-mile target for our, for our launch in 2023. Um, again, we're launching a demonstration in 2020, but by 2023, we want to be doing our full missions. And, um, and so that, there's some advancement that needs to happen on the battery, but we think it's actually very realistic. But it does require real work, and it requires not just doing the work on the actual underlying technology, but also mass manufacturing of those batteries. So we have to solve both of those problems, and Uber will play a role in that. Regulation. Yeah. How difficult is that going to be? Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's appropriately difficult. Um, it's not. You know, we've been we've been pleasantly surprised. I mean, we took the approach um, from the beginning of embracing the regulatory regime. Um, you know, FAA, EASA, obviously um, NASA plays a portion of this. The air traffic control kind of environment, et cetera. Um, there's a ton of different regulatory stuff down even at the community level. There's uh, ordinances, noise ordinances. There's zoning regulations, and we're just sort of um, you know taking in sort of Uber style. We're just you know focusing on the outcome that we're trying to achieve, and we're working closely with regulators um, to, make this, to make this a reality. Now, that isn't necessarily Uber's, you know, kind of history. Um, you know, a lot of people think we would just kind of, like, you know, run in and just try to make it happen, and, you know, and, um, but we, what we found is two things. There. You know, one thing we found and one thing we, is just true. One thing we found is that the regulators are embracing this, and I think it's the excitement of the vision that gets everyone rallied around it, and it's also the believability of ride-sharing in the sky. It just seems like a super, you know, a reasonable business model, and I think everybody really believes that they'll be able to push a button and get a flight with this model. The other piece is that Uber's just grown up as a company. And we, you know, what we do today as a, as a you know, large company on the global stage, you know, we just have to be much more thoughtful and careful and, and, you know, uh, and our approach has to be different from when we were the kind of the scrappy startup. And so those two things have come together to sort of you know, inform our regulatory approach. Former GM executive Bob Lutz wrote this week that this is the end of the automotive era. Mm. 
how much do you agree with that statement? Is this a reason for this partnership and for this, this new Uber initiative? You've spoken in the past about the Uber of five years' time, yeah. the Uber of 10 years' time. Bob Lutz says in five years, everyone needs to get their cars off the road and change them for scrap. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, uh, it's great to hear him say that. Um, you know, so um, our view is that individual car ownership um, is kind of a, is kind of, is sort of something that needs to go, it will go away ultimately because it's very inefficient. I mean, the, the, the issue with individual car ownership is that the asset, the car, is, is only utilized 4% of the time. And in, in a, a model like a ride-sharing model, it's used, it can be utilized 80 to 90% of the time. And not with you know, self-driving vehicles, it can be in the high 90s. You know? um, and when you get to the, those kinds of utilizations, what you see happen is that prices go way down. It's called demonetization. Um, you know, prices go way down. You're, off, you're able to offer transportation for a much, much lower price. So once it gets to the point where the price of pushing a button and getting a ride is l much lower than it would cost you to drive your own car, and it's also ubiquitous and super reliable, right? then why would you own your own car? Then it's sort of more of a hobby to own your own car at that point. It just doesn't make any sense. And so that's what I think he's foreseeing, and I agree with that. That in mind, then, what comes first, VTOL or the self-driving car? Yeah, the race is on, isn't it? Um, you know, I think uh, the self-driving car, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's probably going to, um, it's sort of ahead right now in terms of, like, you know, the deployment. I mean, there's now, I mean, Uber is running, you know, uh, paid passenger trips with self-driving cars today. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and we're, you know, we still have vehicle operators, but we're getting very close to the point where we'll take the vehicle operators out of the car. Um, and so at that point, it, then it's just, you know, can, how quickly can you scale it very, very safely? It's just a matter of safety and making sure that we are super convicted that we've nailed the safety case, um, but that can happen quite rapidly. So, um, and then you know, Elevate has you know, Uber Air has more uh, kind of you know pieces to accomplish. But you know, our deadline for ourselves of 2023 is not that far in the future. So they're they're not that far apart. Two final questions with Elevate and Uber Air: Why collaborate rather than go it alone? Yeah, well, it's a great question. It, um, you know, the the. Our, you know, our approach on this is like let's build what we need to build, um, and you know if you think about building aircraft, for example, if we decided that we were just going to go this go it alone, um, we would have to become an aircraft manufacturer, and, and and by the way, an advanced aircraft designer at the same time. So like we'd have to get really good at the end to end of des conceptualizing, designing an aircraft, and then taking it all the way to certified production, um, and that would be a many year long process. Um, there's and what we really want is to bring this phenomenon to the world. Our objective is not to be aircraft builders, but to be any particular thing. Our objective is to bring the phenomenon to the world. So if we can create a, a, you know, a business model for doing that where lots of players can bring their, their capabilities um, and all, you know, sort of all that they do to the table um, you know, and make this thing move much faster, then we're all in. Final question, the, the kind of the reverse of that. You've got Uber, the ride hailing app. You've got Uber Eats. Mm -hmm. We now have movements towards Uber Air, existing partnerships. That's a lot going on. Yeah. And my, my question is, does that distract from making the existing platforms the best they can be. For example, when you think about the Uber ride hailing app, are you improving that? Will you continue to improve it? Will you continue to look at how you can uh, change its functionality? Will you look to uh, how you improve rider safety, driver safety. Yeah. There's a lot going on at the moment. Yeah, yeah. It's, actually, it's a fantastic question. Um, what I've learned in my career is that there are really two kinds of companies. The kinds of companies that decide to do one thing extremely well and the kinds of companies that try, decide to do many things extremely well. If you do many things poorly, then you don't really last very long. So the trick is figuring out how to do several things really, really well. And so why do you need to do that? Well, you need to do that because the world is constantly changing around you. The technology is changing. The market is changing. Business, disruptive business is being created. If you can only do one thing, and you can just all you do is you say focus on the intern, very insular, um, you will you will be disrupted, um, and you you'll also miss incredible opportunities to innovate. And so we have taken we we are the kind of company. In fact, one of our values is big bold bets. We believe that we must be planting the seeds for the future continuously in order to have a future. And um, and so that's what this represents. And so yes, we have a, we have teams and executives dedicated to improving the experience of today. We have teams and executives dedicated to building the future. Um, and and you know Uber Eats has a, a fantastic executive running that area with a, with a dedicated team. And now that's one of our big bets. It's actually now matured, and we're starting to now blend it into the main business. And that's actually going incredibly well. So it's an example of how these things will play out over time as we plant these seeds, they germinate, and then they get folded into the main business. I have to ask you very yeah. quickly. You have dates. You have plans for testing rollout of Uber Air. Yeah. But we're here in beautiful Lisbon yeah. at the Web Summit. When are we going to see Uber Air on the continent of Europe? When are we going to be flying 
over the river here in Lisbon? I wish I knew. I mean, it's it really, you know, we, the, the cities we choose as our early kind of launch cities are the ones that are um, most leaned in from a technology perspective. They really want this for their city. And the, and the reason we want that collaboration, like at the kind of the mayor level in the city, is because um, you never know what kind of snags you're going to hit as you kind of deploy something, a, a local product. And we want to just make sure that everyone's aligned to try to push through those as quickly as possible and get to, you know, get to deployment. So the cities that, that show that type of, um, you know, kind of appetite and lean into the technology are the ones we're going to work with early. And so LA has shown that, and, and so has Dallas, and that's why those are two of our launch cities.